friends. I'm very happy to be part of this plastic garbage project again, and I'm really curious to find out how um, the exhibition was perceived in different parts of the world and how it was translated to different cultural contexts. I'm really curious to learn about this in the next one and a half days. Um, my main focus at the moment is though not museum outreach, but in-reach, and could rather be called reach in to reach out or reaching in to change the institution of the museum and leave the communities at least for a little while aside until the institution itself had become more democratic, more diverse and more inclusive. And of course always, it's always a bit problematic uh, to speak in the afternoon of a whole day conference because I'm really sorry, but a few of the, the points I want to make have already been mentioned before, but yeah, this is because uh, it's already three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> but uh, it's exactly my uh, perspective why I've chosen this photo here, which shows the Scottish performance artist Anthony Schrag and how he tries to tear down the monolithic statues of the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow in 2008 an institution he feels very ambivalent about, as, of course, on the one hand, he belongs within the system of museums and the art world, and on the other hand, he also would like to critique its static and unchangeable nature. My short input deals with the question if an activist museum practice can change the institution and make it more accessible and more inclusive. After that, I thought that I would like to share a few thoughts about activist museum practice imported from the West into the Middle East. And I would like to end with a few questions that deal with the Plastic Garden project. As I have been thinking about this project a lot since I met my colleagues from Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco and Jordan and Bergamo and Sweden in January 2014 where we um, yeah, met for the first time, before the exhibition then was installed in the Arab world. So let me begin by explaining what I mean with activist museum practice. According to Richard Sandel, a professor of museum studies from Leicester University, who speaks about this in his article on ethics, activism and human rights, the museum can be reframed as a site for moral activism, that does not simply reflect and reinforces dominant moralities, but that is concerned with actively challenging and reconfiguring moralities and human rights issues. An activist museum practice, as Sandel suggests, allows visitors to challenge and reshape opinions and acts towards a more just and equal society. To achieve this museum, as many museum scholars suggest, would have to change. Let me name just a few indicators for institutional change. A diversifying of the audience, an adoption of a moral standpoint, fostering dialogue over didacticism, show new histories and also include conflicts and debates to unsettle narratives and to work with a diverse workforce, that is very important, I think, and with new working practices within new hierarchies. So this would mean that the education department, for example, would be just as important within the institution of the museum as the curatorial department, and I would like to come back to this later on, maybe in the discussion. Here on this photo, uh, I'm really sorry if some of you might know this uh, because I've made a little oath that I always, whenever I talk, <laughs> I use this photo. So, um, so here you can see the British uh, street artist Banksy and how he tries to change the elitist institution, the Temple of High Art, the Tate Britain in London. Banksy just incorporates his critical view on society and politics. Here, the British obsession with surveillance into the gallery space. Banksy's works for social inclusion in an activist way. The masterpiece Banksy puts on the wall of the Tate here is called Crime Watch UK has ruined the countryside for all of us. 
unfortunately fell down after three minutes due to very bad and cheap glue. Anyways, um, so it was not very sustainable. So museums, as Banksy wittingly illustrates here, shall include new stories inside the showcases. Conflict and debates belong into the heart of the gallery space. Now I would like to present two, or at least mention two uh, case studies, two endeavors for activist museum practice. Of course, the range is very, very wide. Uh, we have short-term and long-term uh, projects like revisiting collections, an audience oh. development tool from the UK in London, or an initiative from Berlin, Colonialism in the Box at the German Historical Museum. So there are many different, of course, activist museum practices, but I've chosen two, and of course one is the exhibition, the Plastic Garbage Project. Um, the Museum für Gestaltung Zürich integrated educational work into the exhibition development, as Franziska Mühlbacher has explained. Sandel called a radical transformation in mission, priorities, and, I find this very important, the allocation of resources as an indication for institutional change. So let's listen to our colleagues from the Museum of Gestaltung Zürich later on, if this change is permanent and if the education department is also involved in other exhibitions, um, that are more traditional and that deal with more traditional topics. I'm not sure if this has happened though. <laughs> Another example of an activist museum practice is the exhibition in Berlin, which is on show at the moment in the German Historical Museum. It's called Homosexualities and is uh, shown until December the 1st. This exhibition is a co-production between the German Historical Museum and the Schrulis Museum, the Gay Museum in Berlin. It is the first exhibition that challenges opinion on sexual minorities in this grand national museum, a museum that not only displays German history, but that also defines what is worth being shown, what is canonical and part of German history. So, for the gay rights movement, this exhibition is a big step towards recognition and empowerment. But has this solo show led to institutional change? According to the curators and people involved in the project, it could be that it's only, as they told me, a cosmetic fashion with little alteration to the core value of the museum. Nevertheless, it could have changed some people's thinking and attitudes within the institution of the German Historical Museum. A broader evaluation of this would be necessary, and of course not only amongst the visitors of the exhibition, but also amongst museum staff. I would like to conclude, uh, my uh, thinking is that I, uh, activist museum practice can change the institution, although it is a slow, moving and gradual process and needs sustainable development and patience. Let me end by pointing at a few things I have been thinking about since I was in Bernamo in Sweden and talked to my colleagues from Egypt about how to see. I have worked in Egypt between 2006 and 2008, uh, 10, sorry, conducting research on the new role of museums there. So my question now would be, and this has been uh, asked before, what is different in a context where environmental issues are only one of the many problems that people are facing? This was of course mentioned by my colleague from Beirut before. So when we talk about bringing projects like Out to Sea to other parts of the world, I think we have to reflect on our relationship with these countries. As to the many Arab countries that are involved in the project, it's quite easy to tell. Let me give you Egypt as an example. Between 1858 and 1908, Europeans played a dominant role in the founding of Egypt's first museums in Alexandria and Cairo. And these are exactly, I think, the same places where the exhibition was shown in Egypt. Um, well, 
course, it's just a coincidence anyway. Uh, the Egyptian Museum, the Greco-Roman Museum, and the Museum for Arab Art were all founded by Europeans during that time, during the time when the Europeans increased their power over Egypt. So I think it's crucial to stress here that the history of museums and imperialism walked hand in hand. And this is the case for most MENA countries. So I think we have to absolutely be careful not to enforce neo-colonial hierarchies again, not to be patronizing, as the power relation is still there, it's still inherent in all encounters, if we intend it or not. So the question would be, how can we achieve a more collaborative approach, or as Carmen said in the morning, a more an approach, a demand-based approach of uh, participation? I'm really curious to learn more about this at the conference, and I think the procedure of out to the, uh, from the out to the sea team <coughs> to invite the partners from Egypt who were already working in the field and then handling the project over to them completely was a good and wise idea to develop the exhibition and the program. And yeah, as we've heard earlier on, it's great what has been done in some places, and uh, especially like the idea of refurbishing this old hotel and using it later on for other activities. I think this is really great what they've done there. My colleagues from Egypt have pointed at the fact that such a pile of garbage is not a shock in Cairo, where people live and live from garbage villages. So they collect the, the, uh, the garbage and get money out of this. They said it's not only garbage that can be found in the River Nile, but also dead cows, dead animals of all kinds, and even dead human beings. Of course, the pollution of our planet is a global problem, as we've heard before, and to talk about it is of universal, or should be of universal interest. But is this convincing to everyone? And how? This has also been, uh, this point has been made before. How can we make it relevant to everyone if other problems are on the surface? I'm looking forward to learn about it from the various people at the conference who work for the Plastic Garbage Project in the various different contexts. Thank you very much. For your